awesome meal. I'm so thankful for the men and the ladies that have provided the food for us today. Huh, that's not my lesson. Here it is. Okay. So we're talking. I've got to get the wand of power. Um, we're talking about choosing, again, to be a butterfly through our mental and physical challenges. And, you know, I realize that another word for this is suffering. And it doesn't really matter what aspect of your life that you're in that you feel like you're suffering, but sometimes we go through things that are out of our control and we just need God to help us. And so what do we know? You know what I like about science? To me, my degree was in biochemistry, but really that was an effort to understand my world because there are a lot of things that we understand through science that God has already said that were apparent like this. Um, he spoke the world into existence, and then he said that he made man from the dust of the earth. And then he went on to tell us a lot of other things about how he created us. Do you know the most common elements in the human body? Chinops. I, Angela does. <laughs> Teacher's pet. Um, it's chinops. It's carbon, hydrogen, not nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And sulfur is why when your hair burns, it stinks so bad. Um, but those chinops are, are the, the elements that, the six elements that make up your body in the most common uh, ratio. Do you know where those things are found? Dirt. They're in dirt. Now, what's the other most common thing found in your body that makes up like 75% of your body? Water. water. What happens when you mix dirt and water? You get mud or clay. And so what does God call himself? The potter. And you know, I was only used to seeing this in like, 2 Corinthians 4, Romans 9, but I didn't realize it was also in Jeremiah 18, Isaiah 29, Isaiah 41, Isaiah 64. And I really like, I'm going to turn over, I should have marked this, to the Isaiah 64. I'll give you time to get there, right? Isaiah, this, Isaiah 64 and 8. And he says, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. You are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. And so who does he say God made? All of us. We're all his work. And so what happens to us is that sometimes we forget who made us, that he made us, he shaped us to do his will, whether we remember it, whether we are aware of it or not. And so what do we do when we feel broken? When we have physical and mental challenges, sufferings that seem overwhelming. We know that God made us. We know that he has a purpose and a will for our life. But sometimes we feel like our lives have gotten so messed up by health or by circumstances that we have a hard time coping. Sometimes we feel broken and we're suffering. Thankfully, God is still the master potter. He always will be. Have you ever heard of Japanese kintsuki? Do you know what that is? It's this. It's the act of taking broken pottery and filling in the cracks with gold. I love that. Um, it's called golden joinery or golden repair. Um, the definition says broken pottery is repaired with the use of lacquer and gold, returning functionality and adding aesthetic value to the object. The repairs are visible, yet somehow beautiful. Over the years, there have been accusations that valuable ceramics were purposely broken and repaired using the kintsuki technique to add beauty to the original object. Some say that an item repaired by kintsuki looks more beautiful than it was when it was whole. I love that. So you see where I'm going with this, right? Um, God made us, and sometimes we feel damaged and broken. But if, he let, if we let him repair us, then we can be more beautiful and more worthwhile than we were before. 
And so we have to let him remake us into something beautiful. He knows that we were always beautiful because we were made in his image, and sometimes we lose sight of that. Our challenges can blind us to the opportunities that exist when we let God use us. We need to be butterflies that see the worth in our brokenness so that he can fix us into something better. So that means that being a butterfly is a choice to see the benefits of our suffering. We can encourage others, we can perfect ourselves, and we can prepare ourselves for heaven by giving hope. So one verse that I have really enjoyed, I I like it a lot, is 2 Corinthians 1. If you'll turn with me over there. First chapter of 2 Corinthians. We tend to think that everything was wonderful for Paul, and it was not. And sure, he got arrested by the Romans and got killed by Nero, and, you know, so the Jews didn't like him and things like that. But 2 Corinthians verse 8, okay, in just like a snarky aside, this used to be one of my favorite verses because of the translation. We do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, or as the other ones used to say, we don't want you ignorant, brethren. (laughs) Okay, sorry. I just, I have a hard time reading it without like my teenage self going ha 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 every time. Um, But we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the afflictions that we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Paul was not in a good place emotionally. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. And here's what he said the reason was. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on who? God. And then he said he delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. So what is one of the reasons why, you know, in verse 4 he said... God did what for him when he went through this? Well, he said God comforts us in all of our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we were ourselves were comforted. What's he saying there? Because it happened to me, I can now comfort you, right? And so because that happens to us, we can then extend that to others. Um, suffering makes us more sensitive to the hurts of others. Once you've lost a child, you sympathize with someone who has. Once you've had cancer, once you've had family problems, once you've had health issues, you name it. Once you've gone through it, sometimes don't you want to seek out somebody else who's been where you were and help them through it? God does a wonderful thing for us in the church. He brings us all together, all of us broken people, and he gives us each other for encouragement. You want to help other people through the pain you've gone through. And since you've experienced it, you can help other people better. So we say that suffering produces empathy. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 says, the one that we read earlier, We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and be patient with them all. How, why is one of the reasons why you can be patient? Because at one time, we've all been weak or idle, or faint-hearted. We've all fallen at some point in time, and we can identify with that. And we know that suffering will help us in other ways, too. It has spiritual benefits, but what exactly does it do for us? Now listen, some of these things are really hard, and Romans 5 is like that. Let's turn over to Romans 5. Okay, so Paul is really mean. He always tells us to rejoice in our sufferings, doesn't he? James 2, count it all joy, we read last night or earlier. And he says in verse 3, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces what? Endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and then hope doesn't disappoint. And so what's he talking about there? Well, everybody wants character, but nobody wants suffering. 
There is, there, sign me up. <laughs> no, I want character, and there are lots of women in the church that when I have problems, I go to. But invariably, it's all of the women that have suffered something, you know? And what has it produced in them? Character. And so um, it's, like, it's like praying for patience. Older people know better than to pray for patience, <laughs> right? I remember telling this group of older ladies at church one day, I said, you know, I've always had a problem with patience, and I prayed for it. And, like, as a group, the whole table went, ooh. <laughs> like, bad move on your part, right? And so, you know, praying for patience what does God do? I talked about it. I wanted that miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit that he did not just like, bam. So what did he give me? Situations where I was tested and I had to grow my patience. And they were not pleasant, you know. And so um, we, God puts us in these situations where we need to grow. And so we call those situations suffering. Um, okay, so... I, I have food allergies. I have celiac disease and diverticulitis. And so sometimes my gut hurts, and I don't really know why. And uh, I'm trying to think, like, what did I do today, you know? Um, and my sweet husband was trying to be helpful. And so he came up, and he was like, you know, Heather, with your celiac disease and these other things, you have really been able to help a lot of people. You know, there was that little girl that had severe peanut allergy and her mom didn't know why she was losing weight I mean she was like two and a half and she weighed 15 pounds and I mean and I was like oh tell me okay well you need to go have her tested because I think what she has is a food allergy anyway so you begin like when you see something you begin to say oh well I think I can help you because of this and he was like I'm so proud of you because you've been able to help people aren't you glad aren't you glad you've been able to help people I was like Okay, I know what you want me to say, but right now I'm in a lot of pain. I said, I need you to come back to me later when I'm not in so much pain and I can think straight. And I said, I, I know, I know that I should be joyful, but like in this moment, like right now, I'm not joyful, you know? <laughs> you know? And so, so I want to tell you, sometimes in the moment, as we're going through that issue, you don't necessarily have that joy. You, you can look back on it in hindsight. You can have a good attitude. You can for sure not blame God, you know, and, and recognize it for what it is. But sometimes I think we have to give ourselves a little bit of grace to say, sometimes when you're hurt, you get to say, ow, you know. But other than that, um, I felt kind of guilty about that at the time. Am I glad that I've gone through some of those things? Okay, happy is a strong word. I wouldn't say happy, but am I glad that I've been able to help other people? Yeah, joyful. It has been a good experience that I've been able to grow from it. Because the opposite could also be true. I could also have gone through that, and like we talked about earlier, not grown. I could have blamed God. But to me, that's like the one person in the universe that can help you in turning your back on him, you know? Anyway, suffering should produce endurance. It should produce her uh, character. It should give us hope. And so, but it doesn't happen all at once. It's a growth process. Otherwise, like the person that had the worst thing happen to them, like the next day they'd be the most mature person ever. And, and we just don't see that, right? Sometimes as you age, you come to that knowledge, that maturity, as it builds. Um, and this is the verse that we just read about suffering produces character and hope. And you don't go from spaghetti arms to big fat muscles, right? And so we shouldn't expect for us, as we're in the moment, to have the growth already done. That growth is going to take time and process and turning to God's word and letting your fellow Christians help you, letting God's word build you up. And like, just like you build muscles, fibers at a time, you also build on your spiritual journey bit by bit. For me personally, this was how I had to cope. And I, I think I've 
maybe told some of you this before, but I have an issue with control and I wanted to be able to fix what was wrong. And you come to a, a realization in your life, not all things will be fixed. There are some things that are broken that are going to stay broken. There are some situations that are never going to be the way you want them to be. And you can either break yourself on that or you can be broken and let God rebuild you. And so for me personally, I got an inkling of this when I had children and I realized when you have children, you better just realize you lost all control. <laughs> like the elements, the way you wanted things to go. But for other bigger problems that finally they get so big that you just have to say, okay, God, I give this to you, right? And so for me, I had to do a visualization technique. My mind knew I needed to give it to God, but my heart wanted to keep it and pet it. <laughs> you know, I still wanted to retain the illusion that I could do something when in reality I couldn't. And so this visualization technique that I did, okay, we have to have endurance. This is, this is the visualization te technique. In my mind, when I prayed, I had to envision a big platter and that I had to pray for things specifically, bit by bit, and I imagined giving it to God. And then the next thing I had to give, pick up and imagine giving it to God so that by the end of my prayer, all of these anxieties and issues that I had, bit by bit, I was giving it to him. And then sometimes you realize, well, I thought I prayed about that. Yeah, but you took it back. <laughs> you said you gave it to God, but then you really didn't. Um, you know, the funny thing about that is that I realized after that prayer where I gave everything to God, I felt so much lighter. I felt like my burdens had been lifted. I felt like I didn't have to worry about it because I could say, God, I gave this to you. And I don't know how it's going to turn out. I hope it's good. But kind of like Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even if it's not, you're still in control. I know you'll still take care of us. And for me personally, you know, I like the verse that says, whether we live or we die, we're the Lord's. We live, whether we live into the Lord, whether we die into the Lord, whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. And for me, I thought, I think when you're in a lot of pain, you have to look that in the eye and say, it's okay if I die. What would be the worst? Kevin likes to play a game. <laughs> Drives me nuts. Worst case scenario. <laughs> Okay, let's not go there. But he does, and for him, it's a calming thing because what he likes to say is, what's the worst thing that can happen in this situation? I could die. Somebody could take all my money. This would happen. This would happen. But I would still be saved. I would still go to heaven. You know, you would still love me, right? Yes. You know, and so he's like, okay, so if the elders fire me and people say I'm awful or whatever it is. And so for us, I think sometimes maybe we need to get to that point. What's the worst thing that can happen to me? For me, it was, what if I die and I leave somebody else to raise my six kids? Well, that's not ideal. I'm, I didn't want to be okay with that. But I thought, you know what? I am okay with that in that I told my children they didn't like it. But I told them, I said, I want you to know if something happens to me, God has been good to me. You have to get to that point where you say, God, I belong to you. In any and every circumstance, no matter what you do, no matter what happens, good or bad, I'm yours. So, I like 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. That's what I had to do. I had to cast all of my anxieties on God. I had to give him everything that was on that platter. And I had to realize this is what I personally need to do in order to be okay with what happens to me. And so I told my kids, look, if something happens to me and I die, don't be sad for me. 
And they're like, Mom, that's terrible. And I said, okay, be sad, because you know, I do admit I would want that in some ways. <laughs> but, but in other ways, I want you to know I've had a good life. God has blessed me beyond more than I deserve. And I'm okay when the end comes, if that's now or 50 years from now. Whenever that happens, I'm okay. And so Matthew 6 tells us, Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is life not more than food, and the body more than clothing? But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And verse 34, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will will take care of itself or be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Kevin likes to quote that statistic that says, and I can't ever remember because I can't keep numbers in my head, whatever percent of the things, it's like more than 85, 90% of the things that we worry about never come to pass. That means that we waste a lot of emotional energy on things that we couldn't control or weren't going to happen, Right? And so if we give those anxieties, cast them on him, he will help you. But the interesting thing about that 1 Peter 5 verse is the follow-up to it. Because it says, be sober mindful, be watchful. And he gives us a warning. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a what? Roaring lion. Seeking someone to devour. He He links, rather, our anxiety and the weakness that it causes in us to being more apt to be consumed by the devil. That should give us pause. That back to back, he says, you need to watch out because the devil's after you. And then he says, resist him, be firm in the faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So suffering opens us up to temptation if we aren't relying on God. Jesus knew that, and that's why he said, O ye of ye of, O ye, O ye, O ye of little faith. He linked that anxiety to a lack of faith. So give our, give our things to God and let him repair us. So what about Paul? Did God know what Paul was going through? Absolutely Could he have taken that away from Paul? Yes, he could have. And what did he do? He left it there and he said, my grace is sufficient. Now, you have to think about something. At this point in time, they were taking handkerchiefs. Some translations will say aprons. So pieces of clothing from his body to people and using them to do what? Heal. Heal. So you're taking a guy that's healing other people, yet he has some sort of physical infirmity that he wants healed, and it's not getting healed. What did Paul know? That God was absolutely capable of healing that. He'd seen it firsthand. So then what logical assumption can you make? That God chose not to. And so what did he say that God did that for? He said that thorn in the flesh was to buffet him so he didn't become conceited, right? Because Paul might have started to think that he was all that, right? And so it was for Paul's character that he left that thorn in the flesh. And I think that God absolutely could cure us or fix things, but sometimes he leaves them there. Or sometimes it's just the, the you know, bad draw or for whatever reason, whatever thing is in our life, that we can use that to strengthen ourselves. Um, 2 Corinthians 4 that we read, well, we read 2 Corinthians 1. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4 now. Well, you know what? Before I go there, I want to do this. When we read 2 Corinthians 1.9, he said, Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, 
but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, on God. We have a tendency to want to solve all our problems on our own, but what happens when it's a problem that can't be fixed and is never going to be fixed? I have a friend named Stephen Brad. I don't know if you've seen the Facebook page that he has, Pray for Rose. He has a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter who was just diagnosed with a neuroblastoma. Um, she does not have a good prognosis. Um, a lot of times when you are, because a lot of times those neuroblastomas begin growing at birth, and by the time they find them, um, the, they were saying that two and a half, she's old to have found it and to be treated. So there's a very real possibility that she may not make it. And in reading the things that she, that he rather, has posted about her, and this journey that he and his family have been on, he says he can't control anything about whether she will live or die, but he can control how he reacts to it. And he has really used this opportunity since so many people know their family and have been praying for them and sharing his Facebook post because truly this little girl, I should have put a picture up here, she looks like a little angel. She has big blue eyes and curly blonde ringlets. And if you look like what a little angel looks like, you know, a cherub. Not like the scary ones from the Bible that are men. But, <laughs> but like, like the Renaissance kind of cherub. She's, she's a beautiful little child. And it's hurtful to think that her life may end at such a young age. And he can't affect that. But he has made some incredible posts of living out his faith about, you know what? No matter what happens, God's in control. Sometimes we say that God is in control and then we freak out when we're faced with a situation where we have to acknowledge that that's not the case. Okay, so I have six kids and I am currently teaching the fourth one driver's ed. <laughs> yeah, that's scary. And so um, she is actually a really good driver. But every now and then when she's driving, I don't know if you've ever done this, if you've ever taught your kids or been in the car while they're doing their six or you know, months to a year of driver training, but my foot on my side of the car, just like the other day, I couldn't help it. She came up to an intersection and I, <laughs> I slammed on the brake as hard as I could on my side and it just didn't work. And, um, or like as we're going around a corner, I'll grip, you know, and she got really offended at that. And she was like, mom, I've got it under control, you know? And so, um, I titled this Jesus take the wheel. Um, um, where's my Jesus take the wheel? Yes. And so... I think sometimes, it, like the phantom break, that you're not really doing any good. I mean, like, you know that. But it's an instinct just to do it before you catch yourself. And it makes her mad because she says, I've got this. And so it's insulting to her because she thinks I don't have confidence in her. She thinks that I don't trust her to get us through it safely. And I think, like, that just hit me. At that time, I thought, does God feel that way? Like when I try to take the wheel from him, does he feel like, I've got this. I'm in control. When the kids were little, Kevin used to like to put the kids on a high place and make them jump to him. I don't know. That sounds like a man thing to me. But <laughs> he enjoyed it, and the kids all did it. And then I had one kid that was afraid of heights. And he didn't put him any higher than this. And he said, okay, jump to me. And, and as he's pulling his hands back away from that child, the child is like this forward, you know, like, don't let go, you know. And he said, I said, why are you doing that? And he said, because I'm teaching him a lesson. I'm like, what, to be scared of heights? He said, no, I'm teaching him, trust me. I'm always going to catch you, right? And so I think for us, we should trust God because he's always going to catch us. Um. If we put ourselves in his hand, if we acknowledge his control. And um, I was telling the girls this story earlier. M my husband used to, okay, he would fix things. 
And when he fixed things, I called him 50-50. Because there's like a 50% chance he's going to utterly destroy it. And there's like a 50% chance he's going to make it like 10 times better than before. Either way, I'm getting a better option. It's going to come out fixed. It's just whether or not it's brand spanking new or totally rebuilt, you know? <laughs> and so over the years, I've had to up his percentage because he's acquired skills. And, you know, he can do plumbing. He can do electrical. Boy, the other day, he did something with the boat and rebuilt a carburetor, and you would have thought, like, he was Superman, you know? But as he gets better at these things, I up his percentage. He said, you're going to have to call me 90-10 now. <laughs> But you know what? God isn't 50-50 or 90-10. He's 100%. Every time we get God involved in our lives, every time we ask him to fix our brokenness, he always makes it better than before. You know, he's, he's the master physician. He knows how we work and how we were built and emotionally what to do for us if we'll just let him. And... That's why I like this lesson, I mean this um, verse in 2 Corinthians 4. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, this is, oh, this is 1 Corinthians, that's why it looks so weird. But we have this treasure in what? Jars of clay. Some might say earthen vessels. To show that the surpassing power belongs to who? God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed. Perplexed but not driven to despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Struck down but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body of death Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. You know, um, God could have made our bodies last forever. He could have made us look like supermodels forevermore, but he didn't. Um, I like reading in Ecclesiastes the chapter where he talks about the grinders have gotten few, talking about you're losing your teeth, and the windows seem dim as your, your eyesight darkens. And, you know, all of these physical, and he talks about you can no longer hear All these physical changes, if we live long enough, come to all of us, if we live long enough. And so why does God choose not to keep us forever perfect and things in our life forever perfect? Well, some of it is a consequence of sin, but do you know what apoptosis or apoptosis is? It's spelled spelled like apoptosis. It's programmed cell death. It means all your cells in your body are on a timer and eventually they're going to be replaced. And if they don't, and and so they just like, up, my time's up and I'm going to die. And so that cell dies and your body replaces it and you get a new one. That's what happens in cancer is that it never dies and it doesn't, and it gets replaced too fast. Anyway, that's a bonus for you. Um, But programmed cell death is fascinating to me because who's our programmer? God is. He programmed us to be the way that we're going to be. And so God did not make this body to last forever. We are renewed and remade by God every day. And so sometimes when I have something wrong that causes me problems with my back or my knee or I wake up in the morning, I'm like, ooh, I think crumble, crumble. You know, that that, that little earthen jar is losing a little bit of its integrity, <laughs> you know. But one of my favorite things that my mother-in-law has said recently is this. She was complaining to her husband, and she was sad. Well, she's 71. That she doesn't look as good as she used to. And um, now my father-in-law is not like a super sensitive man, so I was like totally taken aback by his comment. He said, you're as pretty today as you were the day I met you. I, cu- I couldn't believe he's, like, he's the type that would rather just, like, say, you know I love you. <laughs> Good on you, you know. But so he said that to her, you're as pretty today as the day we met. 
And she said, oh, what a gift from God. And this totally didn't go the way I thought. She said, just as I'm losing my looks, you're losing your eyesight. <laughs> I was like, yeah. Like, you know, when I take my glasses off, all the wrinkles disappear. You know? And so, anyway, but think about it. If this world were so great, would we have a need for God to remake us? Would we have a want or a desire for God to remake us? If this world were perfect, would we ever want to leave here? No. But as it is, we long for heaven. We long for a place where we don't cry, where people aren't hurt, people don't get sick, and people don't die. And those are all promises that God makes to us in Revelation. That all of the things that he says, if you'll remain faithful until death, you'll get a crown of life. We know that God will, can perfect us. That if we have endurance through our suffering, that it will produce character and hope for heaven. And so all of the things that we endure, that we go through, all of the challenges that we have, kind of lead us to this point that we realize I have to let God remake me into something beautiful. So in seeing the benefits of our suffering, we can use our challenges to encourage others, to perfect ourselves, and to prepare us for heaven by giving us a hope for eternity. Pray with me, please. Thank you, Lord, for this time of study that you've given to us to help focus our minds on how you want us to be. Help us to be butterflies by being intentional and looking for the best and finding it, and then on acting on it. Help us to squash those inner voices of negativity that rob us of our joy and our peace, and instead help us to rejoice in our salvation. Help us to count our blessings, to be thankful for the gifts you've given us, to recognize them as your gifts coming from you. Help us to serve each other joyfully. Lord, help us to model our Christianity to our children so that they will want to be Christians too. Help us to treat our husbands with respect and to not criticize. Help us to forgive completely the way you do. Help us to love and serve one another and to be more like Jesus every day. Lord, we thank you for him and for his example and for your love that you loved us so much you want us to be with heaven and you, with you for eternity. Lord, we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.